In this video, I'll give an end-to-end -end demo of sending data from Carbon Black Cloud into Splunk using the Carbon Black Cloud Data Forwarder and AWS S3. That includes alerts, watch list hits, and endpoint events. Any referenced attachments, links, or other artifacts are available in the corresponding TechZone article at carbonblack.vmware.com. Before we get into the demo, a common question is, when should I use the Data Forwarder? The data forwarder was built for low latency data streaming reliably at scale. If your organization has high volume alerts or you're looking to bring the visibility that watch list hits and endpoint events provide into Splunk, the data forwarder is your solution. Our Carbon Black Cloud Splunk app offers native inputs for data sets like alerts, audit logs, live query results, and vulnerabilities. You give it an API key and it does the rest. And that works really well for lower volume data sets. But if you're an enterprise where scale and reliability is critical, the data forwarder is our recommended solution. And that's what this video is intended to help you get set up. In addition to the video agenda, to help visualize what we're going to do, here's a high level reference architecture. The basic idea is that Carbon Black Cloud streams data into an S3 bucket. When new data is available in the bucket, AWS pushes a message onto a queue which Splunk checks regularly, then grabs the new data from the bucket. We'll start in AWS configuring the bucket, queues, and permissions, then jump into Carbon Black Cloud, where we'll create the data forwarder and finish with the Splunk configuration. There's a few other considerations in the appendix as well. Since most organizations have multiple teams contributing to this process, we provided the timestamps for each section. In this section, we'll set up AWS. This is a reference architecture based on what we've seen most customers implement. If your AWS or security teams have other recommendations or best practices, it's best to defer to those. Most customers configure the data forwarder to stream different types of data to different prefixes or directories in a single bucket. That allows AWS to push each type of data to a different SQS queue and by having a queue for each data type, it makes it really easy to classify the different types of data in whatever SEM or data lake you're sending the data to. Why do you need SQS to begin with? Well, it turns out AWS S3 wasn't exactly designed to reliably discover when new data is available. Many products that pull data from S3 without SQS can enumerate the entire bucket every time, which can drive up AWS costs significantly and cause much higher latency in the data pipeline. With the SQS implementation, anytime Carbon Black Cloud writes a new object to S3, AWS automatically pushes a message onto the queue. The SEM checks that queue periodically, sees the message that says there's new data available, then fetches the new object from S3. Note that the queue doesn't contain all the content that was written to S3, just a pointer that says, hey, something new was written here. It's worth noting here that we do plan on adding more data types, such as audit logs, to the data forwarder of the future, but we might not update this video right away. If new data types are available, this model makes it fairly straightforward to add additional queues for that data. Let's also talk through AWS permissions. There's a lot to unpack here, but it really boils down to three policies. As soon as we wrap up permissions, you'll see all of this implemented in the demo. First your S3 bucket policy. The bucket policy needs to grant Carbon Black Cloud's AWS principle write-only access to your bucket. The exact principle varies by region, and the list can be found in Carbon Black Cloud documentation. Next, each of the SQS policies. They need to grant your S3 bucket the ability to send a message to each queue when something new appears in the bucket. And finally, the AWS roles policy. This is the permissions the SEM needs to get data from AWS. That role should be able to list or enumerate the available queues. It'll also need the ability to read and delete messages from the queues, and it'll be able to read objects from the S3 bucket. In order to assume this role, Splunk will probably need AWS access keys from a user. In this demo, I'll create a user with no permissions other than the ability to assume the role as specified in the role's trusted entities. Now on to the demo. The AWS S3 bucket must be created in the correct AWS region. 
You can find this with a quick search on docs.vmware.com for data forwarder. Then you want the create an S3 bucket section. My demo environment is in the US region. So I'll create the bucket and queues in US East one, AKA Northern Virginia. Let's create the S3 bucket. Like I said, the bucket must be created in this region specified in the guide, in this case, US East one. And I've created this bucket with the default settings, which work for most customers. If you're interested in bucket encryption or retention settings, both are covered in the appendix of this video. Now let's grant Carbon Black Cloud write access to the bucket. From the permissions tab, edit the bucket policy. Back to the Carbon Black Cloud user guide, this time the configure bucket policy to allow access section. You can copy the sample bucket policy and paste it right into the AWS bucket policy. And this is granting Carbon Black Cloud's principal write only access to your bucket to be able to put the data in there. So change your bucket name under resource, specifying the prefix here is optional. I've just put an asterisk for all paths in the bucket. The AWS principal I'm granting access to matches the one in the VMware docs under US East one. Save your changes. And now with the bucket created, let's create the SQS queues. You'll need a few, one primary queue for each data type and a single additional queue called the dead letter queue. Most SQS consumers require a dead letter queue. It's basically a place they can dump bad or malformed messages from the primary queues if something goes wrong. We'll create that first. Don't forget, the queues need to be in the same region as the S3 bucket. I'll call this CBC demo queue dead letter and just use the default settings. Now I'll create the primary queues. I'll do this in detail for the alerts data type and then quickly for the other data types. It's very helpful for your SEM team to include the data type in the queue name. For example, for the alert data type, I'll call the queue CBC demo queue alerts. The only default setting I'll change is the visibility timeout to five minutes and set the permissions. We need to ensure that our S3 bucket can send messages to this queue when a new object is written to the S3 bucket. This sample access policy is available in the TechZone article appendix. Finally, select the dead letter queue you just created then create the queue. Copy this queue ARN. You'll need it when you configure the role later on. Now we'll repeat on fast forward for the events and watch list hit queues. Here you can see the final four queues, three primary for our three data types and the dead letter. Now we're gonna pivot back to the S3 bucket and configure the notifications. That's what pushes a message onto those queues when Carbon Black Cloud writes a new object to the bucket. We'll do this once per data type. Under the bucket properties, click Create Event Notification. You define the prefix here, but whoever creates the data forwarder in Carbon Black Cloud will need to know what data type this prefix corresponds to. So it's best to keep it simple here and just use the data type as the prefix. So this one will be alerts and the others will be events and watch list hits. You can also put a suffix in here, just in case any non-Carbon Black Cloud objects show up in the bucket. All Carbon Black Cloud data forwarder objects end in JSONL.gz. You want a notification for all object create events and the destination is an SQS queue. So select the queue that you just created for alerts. Save that. Then repeat for events and for watch list hits. And there we have three notifications for three data types going to three SQS queues. If you get an error when saving, it probably means your queue policy is incorrect and didn't specify that this bucket could send it a message. Unless your SEM is running in AWS, your SEM team will need access keys which are generally tied to a user. In this case, I'm going to create a user that has programmatic access only and absolutely no permissions of its own. The only thing this user will be able to do is assume the AWS role that has the ability to do everything your SIM needs to pull in the Carbon Black Cloud data. Your SIM team will need the key ID and secret key generated here. 
Now we're going to create the role that's going to be assumed by your SIM and that user to get the data from AWS. While the use of roles is generally an AWS best practice, you could skip this step entirely, simply providing your SEM team with access credentials tied to an account that has all these permissions. We actually need to start by creating a policy, which defines what the role can access. Starting in IAM policies, create a policy. I put this sample policy in the TechZone article appendix. You can paste that into the JSON tab be sure to replace the Q and S3 bucket ARNs with those you just created. In short, your SEM, and therefore this role, needs to be able to see SQS queues, read messages off the queues, and delete those messages once it's processed them. Since those messages only contain pointers to the new objects in S3, it also needs the ability to read the actual content from the bucket. I'll name this policy CBC Demo Policy which we'll see in the next step. Now we can create the role. The trusted entity is another AWS account, except in the account ID, you actually put your own account ID, which you can copy from the upper right. To that role, we're going to attach the policy we just created. Save the role. One final step. We want to limit this role to use by only those access keys we just created. From the role you just created, go to the Trust Relationships tab and click Edit Trust Relationship. Then replace root with the username you just generated those access keys from. Now we have a role that can do everything the SEM needs. You'll need to provide your SEM team with this role ARN. AWS is now fully configured. If you're handing off to other teams, here's what they'll need, as well as the video timestamps of when the artifacts appeared on screen and the sample values generated in the demo. The team with Carbon Black Cloud Access, who will create the data forwarder, will need the S3 bucket name and the S3 prefixes you defined for each data type. The SEM team will need the AWS access key ID and secret key associated with the AWS user, the AWS role ARN, the region, and the ARNs of the queues that you created and which data types they correspond to. In this section, we'll configure the data forwarder in Carbon Black Cloud. The demo will be in the UI, but you could also use the API as documented on developer.carbonblack.com under the Carbon Black Cloud Platform's Data Forwarder API. Some prerequisites for this step. Your AWS team should have an S3 bucket provision with the correct permissions. They should tell you the prefixes of each data type. You'll, of course, need a Carbon Black Cloud user that has permissions to manage data forwarders or the equivalent permissions in an API key. And you'll want some sense of what data you're going to forward. Do you want alerts, watch list hits, all endpoint events, maybe a subset of endpoint events? If you're not quite sure where to start, there's a section in the appendix of this video to get you in the right direction. In this demo, I'll create one of each data forwarder type and filter events to just those needed to drive a few interesting SEM use cases. Sign into Carbon Black Cloud, open Data Forwarders under Settings, and create a new data forwarder. I'll start with the type Alert. Pretty straightforward, ideally with a name that helps you remember what this forwarder is for. Populate the bucket name and prefix, and then I'll repeat this for watch list hits. And then for endpoint events. A little more to do here, since I'm going to use the custom query filters. I copied all these from the TechZone article on getting started with custom query filters. Here's our three data forwarders successfully created. A quick note on troubleshooting. When you create a forwarder, Carbon Black Cloud tests the connection to the bucket. If you get an error, there's a few common issues. You get a clear error when the S3 bucket doesn't exist. Maybe it hasn't been created yet, or there's a typo. If the error is about bucket permissions, it might be that the S3 bucket doesn't have the correct policy, so Carbon Black Cloud can't write data there. The S3 bucket might have been created in the wrong region, or it might use an unsupported type of encryption. See the appendix of this video for more information on what types of bucket encryption are currently supported. In this section, we'll configure Splunk to get Carbon Black Cloud data from AWS. 
I'll be using the AWS add-on for Splunk, usually on a heavy forwarder, or if you're in Splunk Cloud, an IDM. You should have an index for Carbon Black Cloud data. Mine is conveniently called Carbon Black Cloud, but naming is up to you. From your AWS team, you should have the AWS access keys, the region, the role ARN, and the names or ARNs and data types of the queues. A word of caution. If the AWS and data forwarder were configured a few days before the Splunk input, Splunk will backfill all that data. If you're concerned about the processing or licensing implications of that, your AWS team can purge the queues before you onboard data. In the AWS add-on for Splunk, from the Configuration tab, add a new account. This is where you input the AWS key ID and secret key. Go to the Role tab and input the Role ARN. They don't allow spaces or dashes in the name, so I'll call mine CBC Demo Role. Then navigate to the Inputs tab. You'll create an input for each data type. Create a new input of custom data type, SQS-based S3. This first one is for alerts, so I'll call it CBC Demo Alerts. Select the account I just created, populate the role, the region, and the alerts queue. Be sure to assign it the source type of VMware CBC S3 alerts and change the index to wherever you're putting the Carbon Black Cloud data. I'll also reduce the interval to a minute. That'll help reduce latency of getting data into Splunk. I'm going to repeat that exact process for events, of course, giving it a slightly different name, using the events queue and the VMware CBC S3 event source type, and then for watch list hits. Something to pay attention to. When you select the queue, if it remains grayed out, that likely means the role doesn't have the correct permissions, such as reading messages from it. All right, so give that configuration a few minutes then check the Health Check Health Overview Dashboard. If the data forwarder and AWS have been configured correctly, within a few minutes, you'll start to see data populate here. A great place to check is the throughput graph in the lower right. The volume of event data can dwarf the other data types. So I'll open this widget in Splunk Search and change the y-axis to a log scale, which helps distinguish between the three data types and confirm that they are all, in fact, flowing into Splunk. If you don't see any data throughput or you see errors in the health dashboard, reference the troubleshooting section in the appendix. And there you have it. Alert, event, and watch list hit data is now in Splunk. Data in the dashboards can take up to an hour to show up as they're populated from a data model which Splunk can take a while to build. So don't panic if it's not there right away. If you're looking for next steps or have questions, here's a few places to check out for more content like Splunk app updates, helpful Splunk queries, and data forwarder enhancements. You can also subscribe to the Developer Network newsletter. I get asked fairly often by customers, what endpoint data should we forward to our SEM? Well, I'd love to be able to say all of it because there's so much value in all the visibility that Carbon Black Cloud's unfiltered EDR provides. Unfortunately, the reality is that endpoints generate more data than most customers can afford to bring into their SEM due to cost, scale, or both. The good news is that we built out capabilities like custom query filters to help with that challenge. Every customer has different needs, so we can't provide a blanket one size fits all recommendation. So that's why there's a whole tech zone article dedicated to this topic, providing you with a list of common use cases, building blocks, data size estimates, all to help you figure out the maximum value that meets your data budget. If you're just looking for a proof of concept or proof of value, maybe to try to bring into your test sim before going into production, here's one place you could start. Forward all your alerts. It's generally a great data set that's both actionable and helps establish patterns and trends. The same with watch list hits if you have enterprise EDR enabled. And for endpoint events, uh, alerted events, proc start and netcon events are a great starting point. Alerted events uncover the next layer of detail when you're investigating a CB analytics alert. Proc starts provide visibility into everything running across your environment. And if you have network data sets in your SIM, like firewall, IDS, and proxy, Netcon events can help you tie those data sets to the actual process that created the network activity. 
If you're using the data forwarder in AWS S3 as a way to get data from Carbon Black Cloud to your SEM, you might not need long-term storage in S3. You can configure a lifecycle rule to automatically delete objects, saving you about two cents per gigabyte per month. From your S3 bucket management tab, create a new lifecycle rule. You could apply different rules to different data types through the use of a prefix, but in this example, I'll apply it to all objects in the bucket. The rule will expire, basically delete all current versions of objects. I'll do so after 30 days, though you could certainly change this to as little as one if you're confident that that's enough time for your SEM to have custody of the data. Encrypting data in AWS S3 is optional, but a best practice for many security teams. To do so, for the bucket properties, edit the encryption and switch to enabled. AWS offers two options for encrypting data in S3 buckets. The first is an AWS managed S3 key. This type of encryption is currently supported by Carbon Black Cloud and very straightforward to set up. No extra configurations required. All your existing permissions are sufficient to allow the data forwarder to write to the bucket and your SEM to read from the bucket. The other type of encryption is using AWS's Key Management Service, or KMS. Data forwarder support for KMS encryption was introduced in March of 2022. There are more sub options here. You can use the AWS Managed Key or bring your own KMS key. If you create your own key, note that currently only symmetric keys are supported. If you have a compelling reason for using an asymmetric key, Get in touch with Carbon Black Support, who can assist in opening a feature request on your behalf. Regardless of which key you use, you can see this key ARN from the bucket properties once saved. You'll need to make two permission changes to get data flowing from Carbon Black Cloud to a KMS encrypted bucket, then to your SEM. So an updated permissions diagram here. Start with the KMS keys policy. Find the Carbon Black Cloud principle you granted access to your S3 bucket. If you want to jump back to that section in the video, I've put the timestamp on screen. Carbon Black Cloud's principle needs generate key data and decrypt permissions on your key. And you're probably wondering, why decrypt? Well, it turns out this is an AWS requirement to do multi-part uploads to your bucket. Smaller objects can actually be uploaded to your bucket without the decrypt permission but larger objects require it. And if you don't grant these permissions, you may experience silent data loss. Once you've applied access to your KMS key policy, go to your SEM's role policy. Your SEM, of course, will need to be able to decrypt data from the bucket. So to your SEM's role policy, add decrypt permissions and specify the key ARN. This appendix is going to cover that scenario when you've configured AWS, created the data forwarder in Carbon Black Cloud, and set up all the Splunk inputs, but you still don't see any data in Splunk. The section won't cover blocking errors that you may have encountered while setting up one of those pieces, but I included the most common errors in each section. We're going to troubleshoot by walking backwards through the reference architecture and making sure data gets to each step in the data flow. I probably won't be able to point out to you the exact problem, but we can get closer to where the data is being held up. At that point, you'll probably want to review that section of the video and double check nothing got missed during the initial configuration. We'll start by seeing if any data is making its way to Splunk. Starting in Splunk, we can run a few queries, and these queries are available in the troubleshooting section of the corresponding TechZone article. The first query checks your primary Carbon Black Cloud index for what types of data are coming in. If there's data here, but not on the dashboard, make sure you've set the index in Carbon Black Cloud's base configuration on your search head. If there's no data here, check the AWS add-on for errors. You can do this in the AWS add-on's S3 Health Details dashboard. You can also run a query to look for errors. And the most common errors you'll get here are due to AWS permission issues. For example, this error, failed to download file, is because my role had permission to read from the queues, but didn't have the get object permission on the bucket. So the add-on can see that there's new data available, but it can't download it from S3. As we continue to work backwards, we reach the scenario where you've investigated Splunk, but not found any errors. So let's investigate the queues. This requires AWS access. 
We'll pick a queue and open the monitoring tab. And now we're going to run through two scenarios. In the first, start with the graph of approximate number of messages visible. And this is basically how many messages are in the queue. Here, this keeps climbing. So the data forwarder, S3 bucket, and event notifications all seem to be working fine. It's the number of receives that are the problem. Nothing is reading from the queue. That probably means something on the Splunk side is broken, or the AWS role Splunk is using doesn't have the correct permissions. So double check your AWS add-on inputs to ensure that they're enabled and reading from the correct queues, as well as the AWS permission diagram. A consideration here. Each message in the queue corresponds to one object in your S3 bucket. Each of those objects might contain hundreds or thousands of Carbon Black Cloud alerts or events. When you fix the issue, Splunk could be flooded processing the backlog of data. You can rectify this with the purge button, which clears the queue. All right, this next scenario shows both the number of messages visible and the number of messages sent are zero. So nothing is sending messages to the queue. The other interesting graph here is number of empty receives. This shows us that Splunk is checking the queue on a regular basis, but the response from AWS is of course empty because there's no messages available. And that's good news from a Splunk standpoint. If we can figure out why messages aren't getting to the queue, Splunk should start picking up those new messages right away. To investigate why no messages are sent to the queue, let's keep moving upstream to the S3 bucket, starting in event notifications under bucket properties. Double check these have been created and are configured to send messages to the correct queues. Also take note of the prefix and suffix because now we're gonna look at the bucket itself. If Carbon Black Cloud is sending data, you'll see each of your prefixes in the root directory. You should be able to click into each directory, find the org key at the next level, then the date structure. If you're not seeing the org key and date path structure here, or the most recent data is old, it's time to check Carbon Black Cloud. From the Carbon Black Cloud data forwarders page, find the forwarder, ensure it's enabled, and test the connection to the bucket. If the connection failed, it's likely the S3 bucket policy or encryption changed. Head back to the AWS bucket policy and Carbon Black Cloud configuration sections earlier in the video to troubleshoot these issues. If you've run through all this and you're still encountering problems, head over to the Dev Network section on the Carbon Black Cloud User Exchange. That's all we've got for this video. Thanks so much for watching. Have a nice day.